This podcast brought to you by Ring. With Ring cameras, you can check on your pets to catch them in the act. Izzy, drop that. Or just keep them company. Aw, I'll be home soon. Make sure they're okay while you're away. With Ring. Learn more at ring.com slash pets. Welcome to Story Collider's Stories of COVID-19. This week, we're bringing you two stories about negotiating life under the same roof during the pandemic. I live in New York City, but my partner and I spent the majority of 2020 and some of 2021 living with my friend and her partner at her home in Toledo, Ohio, while we were working remotely. So the four of us survived this time together. We had dumb arguments about scrambled eggs and extension cords and whether or not to go out places and how loudly some of us played rock band on the PlayStation and what time of day. But mostly, we supported each other. Fortunately, we all had our nervous breakdowns at different points in the year, which was very helpful. In our stories today, both of our storytellers are navigating similar adapted pandemic living situations and all of the challenges that those may bring. Our first story today is from Gail Thomas. It was recorded in February 2021 at her home in Brooklyn. Phone calls checking in with my younger brother in Dallas and my older sister in Denver. COVID is still abstract to them, not to me. It's March 2020. I live in New York City, the epicenter with 8 million something other people. I'm staying as far away from them as possible. Luckily, I'm single, I live alone, and I already work remotely. So it's not hard as long as I don't leave my apartment. Our 90-year-old mom recently moved from Oklahoma City to Denver to be in assisted living near my sister Kay. My sister Kay, my big sister Kay, we're both really nice people, but we are super different. She's a CEO, a big picture action taker, an optimist, she says. That's stupid. It's a pandemic. This is not the time to be optimistic. I googled best face mask in January and Amazon delivered my N95s on February 2nd. I'm a former lawyer, a cancer survivor, a freelance overthinker. I like to prepare for worst case scenarios. Thankfully, Kay and her husband moved mom into their house to be safe. I'm relieved. And mom sounds great. I'm happy to live with family again, she says. I'm jealous that Kay gets mom. I know how to make mom laugh. And I want to see mom before it's too late. Now more than ever. In July, I adopt little Desi, my rescue dog, and the COVID numbers go down. So after two weeks together, little Desi and I fly to Colorado for a couple months so that I can see mom and give Kay a break. It's the first time I left my neighborhood since everything shut down. And I'm really looking forward to the break myself, but I'm also nervous about all the sister time because there's already been a few red flags. I start looking for an Airbnb and my sister sort of takes over and starts sending me all these photos of these fancy sterile high rises across the street from her. And I don't want to live in a fancy sterile high rise. I live in New York. I want nature and I don't want to live across the street from my sister. (laughs) So I I finally remember that I am actually a grown-up, and I book my own Airbnb near a park, the biggest park in Denver. They pick us up at the airport, and we drive straight to Kay's house. I had secretly hoped to quarantine in the Rocky Mountains by a stream for a couple weeks, but I do really want to see Mom, and Kay doesn't think I need to quarantine, so I wear my mask in the car, and we drive to Kay's place. I walk in the front door, and there's mom, my little gray-haired mom, sitting maskless at the family dining room table that Kay inherited. She stands up, and I walk over to her, and I give her this long hug, and it feels wonderful and terrifying. Nobody else seems to be worried. I step back, and I take my mask off, and it's the first time I've 
had my face open to someone else's face since this whole thing happened. Thankfully, the meals are in the backyard, because this is kind of hard to get used to. (laughs) But it is open skies in Colorado, and there's a lot more space for social distancing. (laughs) But the first week is rough. Kay's golden doodle, labradoodle, whatever kind of doodle seems to want to eat my little dog. Every time I go to pet little Desi, her dog jumps in front and, and grabs Desi's neck with her big jaw, and Desi yelps and runs away. I can't even get to know my own dog. The next day, Desi pees on Kay's oriental rug while she's on a conference call, and I Google how to get pee out of rugs, and I'm doing a pretty good job just sort of dabbing when Kay runs out of her conference call, grabs a towel, and starts frantically pushing it back and forth. She makes it way worse than it already was. That night at dinner, Kay and her husband sit at the end of the table staring me down, and they tell me that when you stay here with Mom, Desi will sleep in a crate. I feel like I'm being put in a crate. Dinner is every night at Kay's house. I haven't had dinner every night with people for 30 years, like since I was in high school, was I lived with my parents. And she has said that I could borrow the car, but now it's like, well, if you ask in advance, and I was supposed to borrow the bike, but now she thinks she needs it. And suddenly I am under somebody else's control, which I am not used to. I don't know when I'm going to want to borrow the car. I've got to do my own work too. And I, I don't want to ask ahead of time. So, well, well, we can, we can, can, we can pick you up now. Are you ready? I'm no, I'm not ready. It's, it's frustrating. One night in Kay's kitchen, she stands in the middle and tells me that I'm in the most difficult relationship in her life. And I, I'm thinking, well, why? Cause I just push back cause I don't do everything you say. You know, she tells that she gives me an, an, a, an example of her, how she's a good manager at work, like that defends herself. And I'm thinking, this isn't work. This is family. But it is work. It's a lot of work. And I don't know if she wants to do it. And I don't know if I want to do it. A couple weeks later, we're sitting on the pretty bench outside Kay's house, sipping on some wine, and I gently ask her if I can give her some constructive feedback. She doesn't say no. So I tell her, you know, you you really are kind of commenting on everything that I say and do, and it, it makes me feel like I'm getting reprimanded. And she says that she feels defensive because she's afraid she's not doing enough for mom. And that's a new angle that I had not really considered. I I tell her, you know, you're you're doing great. You do so much. I I see that. Finally, it comes time for me to move out of my place and move in with mom so that Kay and John can go on their trip. And I'm really excited because now the single ladies get to be together. And I know that Kay and her husband are being safe. They're driving across country and they're just going to be with Kay's son and his wife and their little baby. It's... It's, it's, it's work. Mom is a handful. At, between mom and the dogs, somebody always wants to go inside or let, be let back outside or let inside. And even when the dogs don't want to go outside or inside, mom thinks the dogs need to go outside or inside. And I have to remind her, mom, you know, we don't work for the dogs. We're, we're, we're okay. They're fine. And of course, we got to make sure that we find Blue Bloods and Law and Order and all the right TV shows. And mom needs a map. She wants a map. I go to AAA to find her all the best maps because she's got early stage dementia. But God bless her, she still wants to keep her bearings. She lived in Denver with her own parents over 60 years ago when she was in her 20s. And one day she has a field trip for us. We're going to go find the house that she lived with them in. And we don't even use the map. Mom's like, turn here, turn there, go there. We find the street and we think we found the house. I mean, it's been renovated because it's been a long time, but I'm so proud of mom. And we stand there and she tells me about that time. And it, it's so special. We get back that night and she opens up this enormous map of Denver that's like three times her size. She's sitting on the couch and I don't even see her anymore. And I'm like, where'd mom go? And she laughs so hard she falls off the couch. I can make mom laugh. And I finally, I start cooking. I make all these zucchini dishes from the garden and it's just a special time. And one day Kay texts me a message that's not about the house or mom. 
It starts with thank you. She says that that morning she found herself being overly critical of her son and his wife, and she remembered what I said. And so she stopped and corrected herself and apologized. And she texts, I love you. That's not a, I wasn't prepared for that. I was unexpected. I, I recover and I text back, I love you too. When Kay and her husband return, we all live in the house together for a few days, which I had been dreading, but it kind of feels like we're a family. And Kay pulls me aside a couple times and asks my opinion on her decisions with taking care of mom. And we, we discuss when is the best time for mom to move back into assisted living. We talk about the case numbers and what the facility is doing for safety. And we actually agree that maybe, maybe later in September. So by the time I fly back to Brooklyn, it kind of feels like almost like we're in this together. I settle back into my apartment and September becomes October, becomes November, and then December. And I have a flight booked for Christmas and I really want to go, but I'm watching Fauci on the news and he's talking about the holiday surge and he's warning against small groups and family gatherings. And I I can't go. I don't want to worry about myself and mom and everybody in the big airport, so I'm not going to go. By now, mom has moved back into assisted living, so Kay has more freedom. And she tells me on the phone one day that she and her husband are going to go on a little holiday visit to for families, for friends, to visit friends in Oklahoma, which is a big hot spot. And she says, oh, it's a small group of people. It's a little anniversary party and everybody's being safe and they're tested in advance. And I don't like it, but I don't say anything. They go. And I text and I say, oh, how's it going? And she sends me a video of them walking into this entryway with all these maskless people screaming, surprise! It's horrifying. They return in a couple days, and I talk to mom the morning after they're back and when she's waiting for them to come pick her up for a visit. And, and I want to say, mom, just, just wait a couple days. But I don't say anything. And sure enough, the following day, Kay calls and she says, well, somebody from the party tested positive for COVID. And I'm, I'm furious inside. I don't want to be right. And I don't want to be glad I'm right. And Kay starts to get defensive. But then I think, I guess she remembers that we're on the same side. And I say, you're managing a lot. I love you and I support you, even if you give mom COVID. They all quarantine per doctor's orders. Mom's annoyed because she didn't do anything wrong. And we wait for test results. Kay texts and calls and she says she's paying the price. And she says that she's truly sorry. And I know she is. She's my sister. We're family. And I don't need to be right. That was Gail Thomas. Gail is a writer, actor, storytelling coach, and lawyer living in New York City. Her voiceover credits include John Cameron Mitchell's Anthem, Homunculus, Angelo Rules, David Letterman, and Beavis and Butthead. Her short comedy, My BFF, won audience favorite at New Filmmakers. As a speechwriter for over 30 world-class events, including the Tribeca Film Festival, her words have been uttered by Oscar winners and fancy people with great clothes. Gail has also told several stories previously for Story Collider about her experiences with cancer. I highly recommend them. Before we continue on today, I just want to remind everyone that if you want to support stories like the ones we're sharing today, if you, like all of us at the Story Collider, believe in the power these stories have to change our understanding of how science happens and who it belongs to, you can sign up to support Story Collider on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash the Story Collider. We so appreciate the support of our patrons, especially during this unpredictable time. You can also check out storycollider.org for more information on upcoming shows and workshops. 
We have outdoor shows coming up this fall in New York, St. Louis, D.C., Boston, and more. And no matter where you are, we have live stream tickets available for other upcoming shows. What's the best way to learn a new language? Immersion. But sometimes that's not in the cards. But you can still learn a language the second best way, and that's with Babbel. Now, I might only be one week into learning German with Babbel, but I'm so excited to start being able to speak German with my mom. With Babbel, you can learn everything you need to have real-world conversations, and all it takes is just 10 minutes a day. One study found that using Babbel for 15 hours is equivalent to a full semester at college, which is bonkers. But Babbel is conversation-based learning with science-backed cognitive tools like spaced repetition and interactive lessons created by real language teachers and voiced by real native speakers. So here's a special limited time deal for our listeners. Right now, get up to 60% off your Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners at babbel.com slash story. Get up to 60% off at babbel.com slash story. Spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash story. Rules and restrictions may apply. Our next story today is from Wendy Bredhold. It was recorded in March 2021 at her home in Indiana. It's Thanksgiving 2020, and I'm sitting at my ex-husband's kitchen table. I wondered all year if this is how we would spend the holidays in our necessary pod. We celebrated our daughter's ninth birthday together in July, and now here we are, celebrating Thanksgiving together for the first time in seven years, the first in our daughter's memory. We are excellent co-parents. I'm sitting here at his table on Thanksgiving, and the virus has demanded of us even greater trust and more communication because of the small person sitting next to me who travels back and forth between our households throughout the week. As far as the virus is concerned, her parents might as well still be married. By rights and Indiana's guidelines for divorced parents, it's his year to celebrate Thanksgiving with our daughter. But he invited me almost shyly one day as he was walking back to his truck to take her to my former home. I'm making a turkey for Thanksgiving. Would you want to come over? Since mid-March 2020, I have only been under a roof with these two. The virus has revealed us as this basic social unit. And every holiday has felt like a hurdle to jump or a puzzle to solve, how to make it special or fun for my daughter, or or even just how to have some sense of normalcy. Thanksgiving loomed. It's always been my favorite, the least commercial, just about family, and food if you ignore all the problematic history. I had nowhere else to go since I'm distancing from my mother and her husband and my grandmother in their 70s, 80s, and 90s. And I didn't want to spend Thanksgiving alone. So I said, what can I bring? And now I'm sitting here at his table that he made with his own hands in an outbuilding of a country house that we rented from a couple of artists not long after we were married. For days after he applied layers of varnish, I was banned from entering lest I disturb some dust and mar its surface. It's lovely, this golden pine. And when he finished it, I I didn't love it. I would have preferred something more rustic and less shiny. And I remember him telling me, as our marriage was failing 15 years later, that nothing he did was good enough for me. I wonder if he remembers that. I hope he doesn't. My ex-husband has characteristically prepared a feast a whole turkey, mashed potatoes and gravy, two kinds of stuffing, roasted carrots, and cranberry salad are all arranged on his kitchen island. 
where we fill our plates. I have brought that Midwestern staple, green bean casserole, sweet potato casserole, wine, uh, dinner rolls, and desserts. And I'm proud of my modest offerings. He was the cook in our marriage. And look at me now, I can contribute. He tells me that our daughter helped him make the cranberry salad. And I suddenly remember our last Thanksgiving together. Now, ordinarily, we would spend Thanksgiving at his parents and my grandmother's. But that year, we celebrated Thanksgiving with my mother at her house. And I love my mother's Thanksgiving. And her meal was as good as I remembered. But she served this canned cranberry sauce. You know, it's shaped like the can and it has the ridges from the molded aluminum. And she put it on the table on on this nice dish and nobody touched it. And when the meal was over, you know, she noticed it sitting there untouched. And and she remembered that only my father, who even then was long gone, he'd passed away many years before, had ever touched the stuff. And, um, and, and she herself was long ago remarried, but had just bought it out of habit. I asked my uh, ex-husband if he remembers this story. And I have this familiar uncertainty. Like, is it okay to talk about when we were married and the past? Or should I stay with the present and our daughter and why we're here together now? Are we as friendly as we seem? or? Is it just for her benefit? And he remembers the story, but I I can't really tell from his reaction. I turn to my daughter and I praise her cranberry salad, but she's more interested in describing her favorite comic strips from her collection of Sunday newspaper funny papers, a hobby of which I was unaware. And I wonder what it's like for her living this bifurcated life at my house for two days, at his house for two, alternating weekends. You know, maybe in a COVID context, it's a benefit to have a different set of walls to look at from time to time. And as she chatters on describing a Garfield strip frame by frame, my ex-husband tells me that uh, the green bean casserole is good. And I smile somewhat ruefully, but I am genuinely glad that I have dumped the right proportions of mushroom soup and milk and canned green beans and dried onions in a casserole dish. It's very different from when we were married and we would argue about the cooking. I would I would offer to learn and to take my turn and then he would back down and say he liked doing it. Now I sometimes give him gifts of food, mostly baked goods, once his favorite gumbo, ostensibly prepared with help from our daughter, uh, although maybe she just took a turn at the whisk. And these gifts feel like an urge to please in an area where I failed in our marriage. They say, see, I've grown. See, they say, I've grown. I notice we're eating from the dishes that we picked out together and registered for as wedding gifts. They're cream colored with a brown rim, simple, rustic even. The salt and pepper shakers are some gorgeous, exotic wood. They were also a wedding gift, something else I left behind. I recall the day that we found the ladder back dining chairs with the rush seats while we were out of town visiting family in Indianapolis at a yard sale. We crammed them into the back of the car And we were so excited by our luck. They were exactly what we were looking for and just 10 bucks a piece. Our daughter's art table is still in the same corner. I watched her take some of her first steps from that table to the play kitchen set across the room. 
My ex-husband says she's outgrown the kitchen set and he's going to give it away. And all these things, and in fact, this whole house, feel heavy with the past and with memory, but their meaning is less clear. They're only objects after all, and the virus has taught us what we should have already known, that what matters most is people. Returning to the island with my plate, I notice that the refrigerator is papered with pictures of their life together without me. There's the gaggle of cousins, all girls, provided by his sister and brother. The camping trips and the beach vacations and the long-awaited trip to Disney World in February 2020, just before the world stopped. While they were there, my ex-husband sent me a video of our daughter describing all the animals she could see from their hotel room. Giraffes and zebras, water buffaloes, cranes. He conscientiously texted me pictures from throughout their trip, as we do. He's the kind of dad who takes his daughter to Disney World and beach vacations and camping trips. They do science projects together and they go fishing and they geek out over Star Wars and Lord of the Rings. It is a father-daughter relationship I can only imagine because I am witnessing it between the two of them. I'm fairly in awe of who our daughter may become because of it, because of having two loving, involved parents, having the security and solidity and the knowledge of that love for all of her life. It seems to me an extraordinary gift but maybe it's more ordinary than I know. When I told my mother about my Thanksgiving plans, she was grateful and relieved that my ex-husband invited me over, and she reminded me that he doesn't like sweet potato casserole. At my ex-husband's table, we each offered our gratitude. And our daughter said, at least we can have Thanksgiving. It was indisputably a thanksgiving, the likes of which I never could have achieved on my own. That was Wendy Bredhold. Wendy works for climate and environmental justice representing the Sierra Club's Beyond Coal campaign in Indiana and Kentucky. She lives in Evansville, Indiana with her daughter Beatrice Rose and cats Pearl and Pinky. She loves dancing to live music, reading, writing, and rabble-rousing. The Storic Lighter is so grateful to Gail and Wendy for sharing their stories with us. The Storic Lighter is also very grateful for the support of Science Sandbox, a Simons Foundation initiative dedicated to engaging everyone with the process of science. This podcast is produced by me, Erin Barker, Executive Director and Co-Founder of the Storic Lighter with assistance from Story Collider's program director, Nissa Greenberg, and senior podcast editor, Jun Chen. Special thanks goes out to Story Collider's board and the rest of our staff, including managing director, Anne-Marie Lonsdale, science advisory fellow, Edith Gonzalez, operations manager, Lindsay Cooper, marketing manager, Nikisha Roberts-Washington, and our new intern, Jamie Banks, without whom none of this would be possible. The stories featured in today's episode were produced by Paula Croxon and Misha Gajewski, respectively. Our theme music was composed by Eva Gertz of the Fulton Street Music Group. We'll be back next Friday with the fourth of six installments of the series. Until then, stay safe, wash your hands, wear a mask, get vaccinated if you can, love each other. Thanks for listening. Having choices is good, and checking accounts are no exception. At Sandy Spring Bank, we have a variety of checking options and make it easy to choose based on your needs. 
mobile deposits and payments, interest checking, or checking with no fees or minimums. Best of all, we'll help you select the account that suits your life. What's your next financial destination? Sandy Spring Bank. Visit sandyspringbank.com slash checking. Member FDIC.